Hey everybody, I'm Ron, W7DOA, and this is a DMR radio. And in this video, we're going to talk about DMR and what it is and how it works. I've had a lot of people ask me or are confused about how to write a code plug and that sort of thing. So what we're going to do is kind of a high-level overview. I'm going to be upfront and clear. This is not going to be an all-inclusive Etsy manual on how DMR actually works. This is going to be a high-level overview so that you can kind of understand some of the terms and how things go in your programming software. So in future videos, we will actually get, dig into the programming software and talk about this radio specifically and other radios. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. Hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified when videos become available. And we will get started. So again, W7DOA, I'm Ron. And stick around. We will be right back. <laughs> All right, so the point of this video really is to find out what DMR is, get some of the vocabulary down, and figure out what all this stuff means and how the system actually works. I'll be upfront and honest, this is not an Etsy level class or training. This is kind of a high overview for you to get an idea of what's going on so that when you go into your programming software, you begin to know what all these different options and, and checkboxes are. So let's try to make this as easy as possible and let's talk about DMR radio. The first thing that you need to understand and the biggest thing that you need to take away from this is DMR radio was never intended to be an amateur radio platform. It was always a business oriented platform. When you have a business and you decide that you need radios in your business, you go down to the radio shop, you tell them what you want and what you want the radio to do. Based on your needs, they suggest a model of radio that will work for you. They help you get the license through the FCC, which you purchase. Then the tech in the back room takes the radio that you bought, programs it all up with your frequencies and all the different options that the radio has, and they install it into your vehicle or they hand you a handheld radio and you're good to go. And at the end of the day, what you really know is how to turn it on and off, how to change channels, how to adjust the volume, and then maybe a handful of features that you find useful in that particular radio. Outside of that, you don't really know a whole lot about the radio. When amateur radios decided that they were going to take DMR in as a protocol to use, it is still a business pro, uh, protocol, and it is now up to us to learn how to do the programming. Typically, ham radio operators like to mess with their radio, so there's a big VFO knob on there so you can change frequencies. Um, there's a whole bunch of menu options that you can mess around with your radio. In DMR, some of that stuff has gone away. Some of the radios like this Anytone still give you some support for that kind of thing, but for the most part, you program your radio and it just works. Changing the channel may mean that you're talking to somebody on one side of the world, a simple channel change later, and you are talking to somebody on a completely the other side of the world. And all it is is a simple channel change. That's how DMR is set up to work. And so there is a little bit of programming involved in the upfront. So let's talk about what DMR is and how it actually works. First of all, we have a radio that is transmitting a frequency. We picked 444.100, which is in the 70 centimeter band for amateur radio in the United States. And this radio is transmitting on that frequency. That's pretty easy to understand. We've been doing that for a long time. Additionally, we have this radio over here that is transmitting on 444.100. And then we have another radio over here that is listening on 444.100. And those two radios are talking to each other. Simplex DMR is a completely doable thing. There are a lot of people who do it and use it that way and it works just fine. Typically though what we do is we have a repeater in the middle. So you would be listening on 444.100 but you would be transmitting on 449.100. A 5 megahertz offset in the 70 centimeter band is pretty standard so nothing new there as well. 
in an analog radio, we might have what's called a CTCSS tone or a continuous tone squelch coding system. Uh, continuous tone coding squelch system. That's what it stands for. A lot of times we hear it just called PL tones. PL tones are a Motorola trademark, trademark so a lot of times we just use the generic CTCSS for those. But it's a tone that's laid over the top of your frequency to activate the repeater. In DMR, though, we do not have CTCSS tones. We have color codes. And they do a lot of the same thing in that that color code is transmitted to the, to the repeater. And the repeater says, yep, that's the color code that I'm supposed to be using. And so I will activate the repeater, begin rebroadcasting locally, as well as dumping this into the Internet. There are 16 color codes from 0 to 15. And why they pick numbers as color codes instead of colors, I don't know. That's just the way it is. So in order to access the repeater, you have to have a radio that has the correct frequency and offset, and you have to have the correct color codes. That will get you into the repeater. But there's a whole lot more that you have to do so that you can talk to who you actually want to talk to. How this all works is when you talk into the radio, it goes to the local repeater, uh, which is right here. Uh, your radio talks to this repeater. This repeater then puts it into the Internet, which goes up to a server. Uh, we will be talking about the Brandmeister servers mostly on this video. Just know that there are several other different types of servers, like uh, TGIF is another network, DMARC is another network. And while it is possible to cross those networks together, that's not really what we're talking about today. We're talking about one network and how it works. So just know that it goes from this repeater across the internet to this server. This server figures out where it's supposed to go and sends it back out to the appropriate repeater, which transmits it, and then this radio hears it. That's how it works. So when you talk into your uh, radio, your voice goes into the microphone, and then the vocoder on the inside samples your voice several thousand times a second. And I don't know exactly what that number is, whether it's 8,000 or 16,000 times a second, I'm not sure. But what it does is it basically says that at this exact moment in time, this is the sound that I am hearing, and it assigns a digital value to that and then sends it down the airwaves to the local repeater, which then sends it on. The server then routes it back out to the repeaters that need to hear it. It uses a protocol called TDMA, or Time Delimited Multiple Access. So what your radio does is it basically transmits for 30 milliseconds, and then it's silent for 30 milliseconds, transmits for 30 milliseconds, and is silent for 30 milliseconds. So the entire frame is 60 milliseconds long. Time slot 1 is 30 milliseconds. Time slot 2 is 30 milliseconds. And the radio is actually able to transmit far more data than what it takes to digitize your voice. So that data is buffered and compressed. 60 milliseconds worth of data is compressed into a 30 millisecond transmission. And then there's still some additional data that can be added. Um, and so there's room for some other information in that 30 millisecond packet, and we'll talk about that. So basically, this is a visual representation of time slot 1 and time slot 2. The light gray bars are time slot 1. That's when one radio would be transmitting. The dark gray bars would be where the first radio is silent, and the second radio could be transmitting. So effectively, we can have two radios in one area transmitting on the same frequency and not harm, not bothering each other. Um, that's how DMR works in breaking up time slots between time slot 1 and time slot 2. So the time slots, whether you're on time slot 1 or time slot 2, the color codes and the frequencies, these are things that are all specific to your local repeater. And it doesn't matter what somebody on the other side of the world is using or listening to in terms of their time slot or color code or frequency. All of that information is stripped off at the repeater level and just the pure data is sent across the internet and somebody else's repeater um, 
then adds the stuff that they need on their end back into the stream. The other, so I guess the next thing we need to talk about is if your voice was just digitized and sent in a digital data stream out to the server and then it routed it back out to every other repeater in the world, it would basically turn the entire world into one big networked repeater. And that wouldn't be very useful because you would never get a word in edgewise. So what we need to do is figure out how to um, start isolating individual users and breaking individual users out into uh, user talk groups is what we call them so that you can talk to the people that you really want to. The first way to do that is with a radio ID. Down below in the description I will put a link to radioid.net and one of our future videos will actually talk about how to work through that process of getting your radio ID. But that radio ID is linked to your call sign. There's some other information like your name, your location, that sort of thing. And then that information will show up on somebody else's radio screen while you're talking and they hear you. So that's pretty, or pretty useful to be able to isolate who you are and also to have the person on the other end look at the screen on their radio and go, oh, I know who that is. So that's one way that we start to sort out how users work is your radio ID. The second way we group users together is with talk groups. And what talk groups do is basically group groups of individuals together who want to talk. And there's um, several different ways that those talk groups can be broken out. A lot of times we use geographical areas. I'm here in Montana, so there is a Montana statewide talk group uh, which covers the entire state. There is a Bozeman Gallatin Valley talk group, which is kind of specific to the Bozeman Gallatin Valley area. There is MPRG1 and MPRG2 that are used extensively by folks in the Helena area. There is a Kalispell Whitefish talk group, and there is also a Hamilton talk group. And so those are specific areas that a talk group is kind of centered around. It doesn't mean that only those people can use that talk group. It just means that that's where that talk group is kind of originated around. So if you were to go to Bozeman Gallon Valley, you would expect to hear other people from Bozeman area. You wouldn't necessarily expect to hear somebody from Germany in there. Um, so then there's uh, larger groups. Montana statewide uh, is larger than a specific town. Um, there are regions. So there is a Pacific Northwest. There is a Region 7, uh, call sign Region 7 area. There's an entire United States. Um, each state has their own talk group and individual talk groups, countries, continents, and there is one entire world talk group that you can go there and talk to people from all over the world. It's a grab bag. You have no idea who you're going to talk to, and that's kind of fun once in a while. The second way we talk, uh, split up talk groups is by special interest. So I like amateur uh, satellite or AMSAT. And they have their own talk group. I also like Soda or Summits on the Air. And so they have their own talk group. Um, I believe Poda or Parks on the Air also has a talk group. And uh, Joda or Jada, however you say that, the Boy Scouts Jamboree on the Air has their own talk group. There are Search and Rescue, um, Aries Missions, Weather Watchers, Storm Watchers, um, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different special interest groups. Let's just take a look at, we're going to jump out of the slideshow here for just a second. And we're going to go over to the PyStar website. This is a website that um, PyStar is the operating system for hotspots, uh, specifically the Raspberry Pi hotspots. We really haven't talked about hotspots that much. A hotspot is really a little mini repeater, and we'll just leave it at that. We'll talk about hotspots in, in other videos, um, but they're just kind of like a little mini repeater. But anyway, the point of this is there is a list of talk groups that Brandmeister currently has. And as you can see, there are a lot of talk groups that you can put into your radio. Now, there are some folks who um, actually put all of those talk groups into their radio. I am not one of those people. Um, this radio here will certainly handle all those talk groups. Um, I'm not going to try to sort through thousands of talk groups to talk to the people that I really want to talk to, but that is a possibility. Um, 
All right. So the next thing that we do with talk groups is we talk about um, two different talk groups, and they are static talk groups and dynamic talk groups. Um, the really easy way to think about a static talk group is the specific repeater that's local to your area has some talk groups that it will always transmit if it hears activity on those talk groups. It will always, always happen. And those are static talk groups. So, for instance, a repeater in the Bozeman area might have the Bozeman area talk group always going to transmit on it. And it might have the Montana statewide talk group always transmit on it. What it would not have is, let's say, a talk group from Ohio would not transmit in the Bozeman area. So that's where dynamic talk groups come from. Dynamic talk groups are uh, all the rest of the talk groups that are not static on that repeater. And how we activate dynamic talk groups is we might want to talk to somebody in Ohio. We're in Bozeman, and we want to talk to somebody in Ohio. So we have a program, uh, we have a channel in our radio that's programmed with the Ohio State Talk Group. We go to that channel, and then we just bounce the push to talk button, and that sends a message to the repeater, and the message to the repeater basically says, activate this talk group, and then you can use it. That talk group remains active on that repeater for, um, depends on how the repeater is programmed, but typically <clears throat> 10 to 15 minutes after the last time you push your push to talk button. <clears throat> Basically what that does is it keeps, uh, it allows you to use the Ohio Talk Group in Bozeman, but people from Bozeman don't have to listen to days on end of traffic from Ohio. So that's how dynamic talk groups work. So when we put all this together into a radio, there is a lot of things that happen very rapidly in a radio. So we push the push to talk button. Your radio then connects to the repeater with the correct frequency and color code, and then you start talking. Your voice is converted into digital information. Your radio ID, your personal radio ID, and the desired talk group that you want to use is then added into that digital information stream. All of this is compressed down to 30 millisecond packets and transmitted across the airwaves. The repeater receives the transmission and it sends it, uh, first of all, it rebroadcasts it locally, but then it sends it to the network server via the internet or the network, however your specific repeater is connected. And the repeater also strips off the color code um, and the, the, the time slot um, from that data stream because it's no longer needed. And then the server, the Brandmeister server at the other end, sorts out what other repeaters in the world are supposed to be hearing this traffic, and it sends it out to them. Those repeaters then transmit that digital information to a radio that's listening in their area. The repeater will also add their color code and their time slot back into that data stream, and then the receiving radio hears it. The radio determines that the talk group is one that it is supposed to be listening to. It begins to decode the data, and it can display the name and location um, and the call sign of the transmitting radio on the other end. Um, and then it begins to unmute the squelch and send that voice back out to the speaker for you to hear. So all of this happens in seconds, or milliseconds, I should say, and it all happens very quickly. That's a basic overview of how DMR radio works. And so in future videos, we will talk about how to actually program this radio. And uh, we will start from scratch like this is a brand new radio with a brand new code plug. Uh, we'll do a short video on where to get the information to put into this radio. So that's it um, for today. We will go ahead and close this video out. Thanks for sticking around with me. Um, like I said before, if this is the first time to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. There's a bell icon next to it. Go ahead and hit that too so that you can see future videos when they come out. And uh, we will work through this process of DMR radio. Thanks for joining. Again, my name is Ron, W7DOA. 
Seven threes.